Hi guys, Matt Easton here. So here's something I don't do very often, but I might do a little bit more in coming weeks, hopefully, and that is an unboxing, or more specifically in this case, an unwrapping. So what do you guys reckon this is? Um, might think it's quite easy to guess, maybe it's a sombrero? No, it's not. Um, I do fancy a sombrero, actually, if any of you want to send me one. Uh, but this isn't a sombrero. This is, well, let's see. You can probably guess already. Um, so this is a thing, I'll talk a bit of, and while I open it, this is a thing that I've uh, meant to get for quite a long time and uh, just kind of haven't got round to it. <coughs> and uh, oh, let's, uh, da -da -da. Incidentally this knife I'll be reviewing in, um, at some point in the, in the not too distant future. Uh, very useful, it's UK legal, non-locking, uh, good little thing, good edge on it, very good for opening packages. Um, so we've got UK regulation brown tape here with some uh, black bin bag, bin liner, or, or uh, refuse bin, I don't know, what, what do you call bins in different countries? I don't know, we call, just call them bins. Um, but, uh, this is not easy to do actually with uh, staying facing the camera, so but, uh, tribute to Scal here because I know he likes to do these kind of things. He's got it down to fine art, of course. I'm not as experienced in this uh, unwrapping business. Right. Ooh. Can you start to see what that might be in there? Yeah, okay. It's a... <laughs> I guess 99.9% I guess .9 of you guessed anyway. It's a uh, boss, uh, centre boss, centre gripped boss circular shield, Viking type shield. Um, sorry. And it is from Shields Plus, which is a UK based company. I've known of them for many years actually. Well, I don't know how long, I think they've been around for like 20 years or more. Um, and I have to say I got very quick service from them. Their shields uh, range in value obviously depending if what you want they, they could go up to anything theoretically but they uh, you can get a kind of centre boss held shield fully made ready to go unpainted um, for about £50 uh, UK and it costs about £10 for postage. So this cost me I think this was £55, so £65 with postage, which is fine. I know I can make one for cheaper, but you know, then you have to buy the boss, you have to buy the components, and frankly, these days, I'm a little bit busy. That's why I don't make more videos than I did. Um, so, quite frankly, I don't have time to make one, but I do have time to use one. So, why have I got one of these? Well, first of all, why wouldn't I get one of these? I'll just put the knife away. So, First impressions. It's heavy. Um, I actually weighed the package before I started this video because I thought why waste time weighing things while the video is rolling. Um, and it came out at six and a half pounds. Um, now I need to do a little bit of research on the weight of kind of uh, dark age boss held shields. Um, I don't know whether that's, that seems quite heavy to me. Perhaps a little bit over heavy. Um, then again, these are made of plywood, usually, these days, as you can see there. And plywood is, generally speaking, heavier than planks of wood, because it's denser and it's got a load of glue inside it. So let's have a look at it. So what we've got is a essentially a plywood circle with a hole cut in it. Then we've got a steel boss, mild steel, I would imagine, forged boss. You can see it uh, looks like hand-forged, actually. Quite a authentic looking boss. I have to mention actually, it's got a little bit of um, rust residue on the surface. Not that bothers me at all, it's, it's, it's like less than five minutes, probably two minutes to uh, clean off. Um, but that's not great, you don't, don't really want to rust, or oh, is it rust residue? Difficult to tell whether it's rust residue or something else actually. But anyway, um, if it were rust, and I think it probably is, that's not good, you don't want that in a package, so that's a, that's a negative. Um, however, yeah, it looks good. It's, um, it's a plywood, uh, I believe it's one centimetre or ten millimetres um, thick plywood disc with a hole cut in the middle. Iron, mild steel. Um, mild steel and iron are kind of interchangeable terms actually. In modern, in modern parlance we call it mild steel, but historically there wasn't really a mild, you either had iron or you had steel. Um, but uh, the difference is of course mild steel you can't heat treat carbon steel you can. I think the barrier is somewhere around 1% of carbon below that is classed as mild steel and you can't heat treat it. 
Um, historically it probably just would have been known as iron. So you've got a uh, iron or mild steel boss. Um, I just realised it can hold this by the handle at the back and it makes it a lot easier than holding, <laughs> holding the great big disc. Um, yeah, so we've got the iron boss, nice, good, seems to be about two millimetres thick, secured by one, two, three, four, five, six rivets, and they are indeed riveted at the back with washers. Um, it looks the part, I would say it's fairly large compared to historical ones I've seen. I should mention, just briefly, I'll probably talk about this more in coming weeks, um, I, uh, my foundation is actually in studying history and archaeology at school and then at university, and actually, the periods that I had specialised in at initially were the periods of the Shields, was actually the Anglo-Saxon Viking Frankish period. I had to study Charlemagne at school and I had to study the Viking invasions and, and um, the migration era at university. I have actually seen quite a lot of original shield bosses. Um, they vary in design, they vary in size. I'll probably talk, uh, in fact I definitely will talk more about shield bosses I think in the future because they're an interesting topic. I'm sure some of you know far more about them than I do, um, but generally speaking, the bosses that are made for modern uh, reenactment or um, historical fencing tends to be a little bit thicker than the historical ones, and this is something that's led to some debate. Why are some of the historical shield bosses, particularly the early period ones, the kind of migration period, 5th, 6th century, they're particularly thin, or some of them are, not all of them are, but the, the kind of coronated type ones, the types you typically see in Frankish and Anglo-Saxon graves during the migration period, are actually quite thin, and that leads to some debate why they're so thin. They wouldn't stand up to a huge amount of abuse, which might mean that the way that we think that they were using shields might not be exactly how they were using shields. Um, but yeah, as I said, I'll talk about that more in a future video, a more specialised one. Um, so it's canvas covered. Uh, painted white so you can paint whatever you want on it. Most people who are buying these I imagine think of it as a Viking shield and so they paint Viking-ish designs on the front. I've actually been doing a bit of research into Anglo-Saxon and Frankish um, shields and it seems that for the most part they didn't paint anything on their shields. But also it seems, and I will do yet again I'll mention a future video, I am planning a video at the moment um, on this it seems that a very large number of Frankish and Anglo-Saxon shields didn't actually look like this very much at all, i.e. they weren't flat. A lot of them seem to have been domed or conical. But it, uh, there's some debate around this, so I'll go into more depth than that in future videos. So for the time being, let's call this a Viking shield. So it's ready to be painted, it's um, canvas covered, white painted, it has a um, thick leather, I think it's described as rawhide, I'm not sure whether that is rawhide or not, but anyway. Let's call it rawhide. It's got a rawhide uh, rim to protect the, um, protect it from you know blows and cuts and other kinds of uh, damage to the edge and hide the fact that it's made of plywood. Um, so there we go. Yeah, the front looks the part. Let's look at the back. So the rim, as you can see, is um, uh, pinned on with uh, pretty standard kind of tacks. We've got the um, six rivets have come through here. Two of those go through the handle. One thing I have just noted, well, I initially when I was holding it I was thinking that the handle was slightly loose, but actually the handle's not loose, the handle's completely rock solid. What I was feeling was the leather, there's some leather strip wrapped around the handle, which is a good idea because if, if it was just the strip of steel it wouldn't be very comfortable to hold. Um, I foresee that that leather strip is not going to stay on for very long, it'll probably need re-wrapping or something better being put around it. Historical surviving shields from uh, Viking ships um, and um, burials and such like show that some of these iron strips that went across for the handle actually had kind of curled up edges showing that they had a wooden element to make the grip a little bit fatter and more comfortable to hold which makes sense and also of course having those sort of bits to hold the wood would help keep it in place. In terms of size I've got absolutely bags of room so one of the things that inspired me to get this shield was that uh, one of the guys in my club is a long time Viking reenactor and he often brings down his Viking shields which I should mention are his are bigger than this um, they're more like, this is 24 inch diameter his are more like kind of 30, I think 32 inch diameter and I specifically wanted a smaller one actually, I wanted something that was a little bit lighter, a little bit more mobile um, and he often brings them down to the club 
and in our kind of casual sparring after class, I don't, I certainly don't teach any sword and shield stuff, it's very new to me, but I do enjoy picking up his shields and having a play with them, so I thought I'd get one of my own so I could get a bit more hands-on experience and get a bit more time spent using them. And as I say, I wanted one that was a bit, bit smaller, lighter and manoeuvrable. Now lighter, I'm not sure there is, at six and a half pounds, it's a fairly heavy thing. I've got to say though, it's not too bad. I mean, remember that you're not swinging a shield around in the same way that you're swinging a weapon around. So a typical Viking sword of this period, for example, usually weighs uh, between, they can be less than two pounds, but usually they're between two pounds and two and a half pounds. They can be as heavy as three pounds. I have seen historical examples that have weighed in at three pounds, however, which is pretty heavy for a one-handed sword. Historically speaking, there are not many one-handed swords from history that were actually intended for use that weigh more than three pounds. Three pounds is kind of the peak for one-handed swords. Um, so there are some really big, really big, heavy, chunky Viking swords. However, most of them tend to be only about two pounds, two and a quarter pounds, something like this. And they tend to have relatively short blades, usually about 28 to 30 inches. That's not super short, but it's about the same size as a, a large cutlass, for example, or, um, or a falchion. It's not as long as a, as a typical um, kind of sabre, for example, or, or even side sword. Or Arming swords tend to be a little bit longer. They're not always. Some arming swords are shorter. Henry, the, uh, Henry V's um, arming sword is only about 26 inch blade, I think. Um, so, there we go, yeah. On first sight, I'm quite impressed with it. It's quite heavy. But I have to say, I'm standing obviously in my study here in a confined space, so I need a little bit more space to wave it around and see what I think about it. But first thoughts are, it's good fun. And do you know what? At 24 inches, I think this is pretty much big enough for me. I'm not sure that I want anything a lot bigger than this. And that's one of the other things I wanted to say, was that a lot of reenactors seem to focus on really quite large shields. And actually, if you look at the historical record, because we do know the diameter of quite a lot of shields from... Uh, burials, um, and particularly in the earlier kind of migration era, in the sort of between the 5th and 7th centuries, you can often in graves see where there's been elements of edging, or um, little nails for example, in the shield. You can actually tell the diameter of the shield. Sometimes it's even just a discoloration in the earth, you get darker earth where it's decomposed, where the wood has decomposed. And you can often tell the diameter, and uh, based on that, we've got a fair, a fair amount of stats about the size of shields, and it seems that a lot of these boss-held shields, actually, they were, you know, in, certainly in the early period, not very big, about this size, about 24 inches. And then it's only really when you get into the much later um, kind of Anglo-Saxon period, towards the Norman Conquest, that you seem to get the, the bigger shields. But there's, you know, the data sample is relatively small on this stuff, so we're making certain assumptions from the stats that we have available. Um, but anyway, there we go. There's my one of my first unboxing videos. I'm, as I say, I've got some more things on the post to me, in, in the post to me at the moment, so I might do some more of these. But uh, first sight, I like this. My... What criticisms would I say? Um, the rusty residue, I don't like that, but it's not that big, um, not big thing. It feels quite heavy for its size. I'm not sure if it needs to be that heavy for, for its size. And this leather thong is a bit naff. It's already sliding up and down the grip, which is a bit annoying. So I'm going to have to sort that out pretty much straight away. Um, you can get these incidentally with a, a guiche, a, a strap which you can wear over your shoulder to hang it off to relieve your arm when you're not actually using the shield actively. I elected to not have that fitted because I'm not using it for reenactment or you know, dressing up or anything, I'm using it for fencing, so <laughs> I'm only going to be using it actively, so there's no point paying extra for a strap. Um, I probably will paint something on the front, just because why not? Um, but yeah, good fun. And uh, I should mention once again, this comes from Shields Plus, and I will put a link to their website below here. Cheers, guys!